Uh, my name is Greg Eastwood. I'm the uh, interim president here at Case Western Reserve University. I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> How nice. Thank you. Uh, we're getting off to a good start. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you to the university, to uh, the Amethyst Stone Chapel. So, uh, this is a very nice venue to have this kind of an event. So thank you for being here. And uh, those of you who are outside of the university, special welcome to the university. I'd like to uh, also welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Joan Southgate, who you'll hear a lot more about and from in a few minutes. I just, I just had an enjoyable lunch uh, with uh, Mrs. Southgate. The annual Martin Luther King Jr. Convocation holds a particularly meaningful place in our hearts. We join together to pay tribute to a man whose humanity, courage, and leadership affected each of our lives. And when I saw that script, I thought a little bit about this. What did a black man who was killed after his um, mission was only partially accomplished many years ago have to do with my life. And it occurred during a time of my life where I was very busy and sort of preoccupied by other things. I was in school, in medical school and training and so on. And I won't tell you, I mean, I'm not here to talk about myself, but it, it caused me to think about the effects that Martin Luther King Jr. did have on my life, and they're profound. Dr. King displayed unshakable courage and conviction and inspired millions of other people to do the same. Case Western Reserve University has a long tradition of honoring the legacy of Dr. King by inviting speakers who can speak directly about their own courage and conviction. In the past, the university has hosted such notable speakers as Fred Gray, who was the attorney for Dr. King and also an alumnus of this university, Reverend Otis Moss, Jr., and Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones. Today's speaker clearly is in good company. We will hear more about uh, Joan momentarily, but I'll tell you that she displays the very same courage and conviction that Martin Luther King did and has very much of the same inspiration. She spent 30 years as a social worker advocating for those most needy among us. After a lifetime of service at a time when most others would retire, Joan boldly followed a dream that carried her more than 500 miles to freedom. We're honored to count Mrs. Southgate as an alumna of the School of Applied Social Sciences, now called the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, uh, then of Western Reserve University. In fact, her class photo is featured on the cover of the Case Western Reserve University calendar for this year. And when you look again at your personal copy, which I'm sure everyone has, there she is, right down there. <laughs> Actually, I was telling some just earlier that I uh, gave this to my mother. My mother is uh, nearly 95 and uses a calendar to keep track of which day she's on. Not bad use of a calendar, I think. Um, before we hear more about uh, her amazing story, please join me in welcoming members of the Donna Capella to share two musical selections with us. Acapella. We are Case's first South Asian uh, acapella group. Um, we're about a year old. Um, and as you can see, we're uh, consisting of people from all different years in undergrad and all different backgrounds. Uh, and basically, we uh, take South Asian music and fuse it with Western music and sing it acapella, so it brings a different flavor and diversity to Case. Um, the first song we'll be singing is a mix of Usher's You Make Me Wanna with uh, a South Indian song um, called Kadalin. 
everybody. you do think about her ringing all that things that come along with you make me you make me want to leave the one I'm with start a new relationship with you this is what you do think about her ringing all that things that come along with you make me before anything became between us you were like my best friend the one I used to run and talk to when me and my girl was having problems you used to say it would be okay, suggest little nice things I should do. And when I go home and I lay my head down, all I seem to think about was you. Sunny sa, sorry got a sunny sunny funny sunny sa, saga mama for mother is a sunny sa, sorry got a sunny 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 sa, saga mama for mother is a. is a fusion between a North Indian song, Kehna Hikya, and uh, Mario Vasquez Gallery. And it's tearing me up 
heart Just another priceless work of art In his gallery Thank you very much, that was great. Uh, I'm Eric Dickin, as, and as director of campus events, I'm most often found behind the scenes, um, assisting with preparations for events like this, and making sure that the speakers have what they need. Uh, but I'm a firm believer in making sure that introductions come from someone who have, have a personal connection with the speaker. And while that could be so many people for Joan Southgate, today I'm honored to fill that role. Like some of you, um, I learned of Joan Southgate when the mag local media and, and Case Magazine covered her amazing journey retracing the steps of the Underground Railroad. I followed the story with admiration and respect, and as you see in your program, Joan has literally walked the walk to demonstrate her convictions and passion about Cleveland's role in the Underground Railroad. Well, as a student in Mandel Center for Nonprofit Organizations, right now, uh, my degree program includes a sequence of strategic planning courses that provide us with a learning opportunity while we help a local nonprofit organization plan for organizational success. Restore Cleveland Hope, the organization that Joan helped found, submitted a proposal for our consideration. The proposal described a group of concerned and committed, passionate advocates that met around Joan's kitchen table. Um, they were talking about their desire to save the Kozad Bates House and tell the story of Cleveland's r strong anti-slavery past. The language in the proposal was so descriptive that we could literally see ourselves pulling up a chair and joining the conversation. Our team had the opportunity to work with, alongside Joan and her team and we jumped at the chance. And since September, our team has met regularly with Joan and the planning committee that she's assembled. They're people that you'll read about in her book. The, the group includes family members, friends, uh, f people from her church, um, and even a classmate from her time when she was a graduate student here at Case Western Reserve University. They share Joan's passion and commitment, and all of these people, and undoubtedly everyone gathered here today, share the central idea from her book, which I'll quote, the lesson of the Underground Railroad is still relevant today. Courageous individuals moved by the dictates of justice and humanity can make a difference. In her quest to honor those who traveled along the Underground Railroad, Joan walked hundreds of miles, presented to hundreds of students, and has touched thousands of lives. Please join me in welcoming author, activist, and alumna, Joan Southgate.
feels like circling around and coming back home. Partly because this is my alma mater, but also because we are here in this space, on this land, and this is such sacred ground. It's also, I feel it, it's my neighborhood. I don't live far from here, and I've raised my children right in Glenville and considered all of this space as ours. I also feel that because my walk began in part in connection to many schools, and one school in particular that my grandsons attended right here in University Circle, Citizens Academy that meets at the temple. Oh, about, six, about six weeks before I actually took off to begin my walk, I led a group of 150 students and parents from Citizens Academy on a short underground railroad walk from their school here in University Circle to the lake. And that too was to honor all of those involved in the Underground Railroad. This all started and it's grown into something that's way beyond anything I could have imagined. It started let's see, six years ago, seven years ago, and began with a notion, more than a notion. It really was something that had bubbled up out of me for maybe even longer than I knew. Uh, I'm going to read a little from my book that I wrote about the walk. When I was little, well, maybe not so little, at Croton Elementary School in Syracuse, New York, if slaves or slavery were part of a history lesson, I always felt so sad. There I sat, usually happily popular lead kid in the classroom. Frequently teachers pet because I was eager and articulate. But suddenly, but when slavery was a lesson of my country's history, I suddenly was alone and ashamed of the people I came from. It made no sense. I never, never was ashamed of the people I came from. I was never ashamed of being colored. I always felt superior in really important ways. What I looked like, the way I dressed, where I stood in classroom testing, what we planned for an after school play. Yet, when we talked of slavery in school, that could only be about me, the only black kid in this essentially all white class. And it was pathetically shameful, shameful that those people, my people, could be uneducated and scared and abused. What had they done? I don't remember even raising my hand to offer a dent about Tubman Douglas, Sojourner, or any truth. And actually, heroic Negroes were already a part of who I was from all I had read and been taught at home. But during this lesson, shame overwhelmed me. Shame closed my usually smart, show-off mouth. It felt as if the slaves had done something wrong. How horrible. That should never happen to children. I think of my ancestors, and I am humbly grateful. 
What was that like to work past exhaustion, past fear, past rage and suffering, past grief? I have nine grandchildren who need the truth. I want all children to know a sense of wonder and gratitude for the American slaves who worked so hard building this powerful country. The slaves' strength, creativity, and courage should be taught as core curriculum in every school. For some reason, I'd been thinking about slavery a lot. Slavery came to mind as I took my usual stay healthy walk on tree-lined East Boulevard on Cleveland's east side. And suddenly, I was stunned by something I had always known. American slave families walk hundreds and hundreds of miles running to freedom. Who were those amazing people? How could they do it? Take children, small babes slung across their hips. And out of nowhere, a question repeated, paced with each of my footsteps. What was it like? And how can I praise them? What was it like? And how should I praise them? The answer fell into place as I rounded the corner for home. An ancestor's whisper, walk, walk. Since answering that calling, my mother always used to say, something told me. That day on East Boulevard was something like that. It was something told me. So walk, well, I was 70 years old. I had no idea how to even imagine walking hundreds of miles, where to start, how to go about it. And I said to my friend, Claret Moore, my walking buddy, that what I planned, and she did not <laughs> oh, slap me to bring me back to my senses, <laughs> didn't fall down laughing. And once it was spoken out into the air, and I told my children, and suddenly it began to take form. But it couldn't have taken form without the help of so many, many people. But it did. With the help of students that I, when I, I spent two years going into classrooms all across uh, Cleveland, I, and the children taught me as I told them the story of the Underground Railroad. I spent 14 months getting this old body to begin the walk. I did uh, 40 minute, three days a week uh, strength training based on Miriam Nelson's book, Strong Women Stay Young. I spent many, I spent the same 14 months of intense uh, training, increasing the length of my walk, which had been, I called it an exercise walk. That's really not true. It was more like an exercise stroll, and I would get to it instead of every day, maybe once or twice every couple of weeks. So I up that to the point of work walking five to six days a week, and uh, depending on Granny T's book. Do you know who Granny T is? Some of you do. So Granny T uh, was this woman who at age 90, emphysema, two hearing aids, osteoporosis, and short and yet bent because of the osteoporosis, arthritis, decided that her mission was walking across the country be, to speak about campaign finance before. Now, Granny T, somewhat like I, had been an activist all of her life, so she knew that she wanted to bring this fact of having, having to be a millionaire to 
run for public office was ridiculous, is ridiculous, but that's the way things are. So she took her mission across the country. When she got to the East Coast, there was a snowstorm. So the car couldn't get through, and you know what she did? She sent home to New Hampshire for her cross-country skis. <laughs> you hear me say that she was 90. She not only owned cross-country skis, but she knew how to use them. She sent for her cross-country skis and skied 100 miles down the East Coast in a snowstorm. She makes my walk look like a stroll around the lagoon. <laughs> But the reason, the mission was there. And for me, the mission was to make sure that with my help and maybe the help of so many of the people that came to this project with the same passion as mine, would help to make it so no other child, black or white, felt that kind of shame about who the slaves were. We need to concentrate on who those people were, not what was done to them. It's not something we can ignore or forget or that shouldn't be taught, the horror of slavery. But you have to know, you probably already know, that this country was built on the backs of the American slave. It took their creativity their strength to make this country what it is. Today, I, in, in thinking about, well, not just today, but in thinking about Martin Luther King and the 60s revolution, it's, it just is as if the Underground Railroad spirit and what went on during the 60s revolution are almost identical. It was the sense of people doing something that was right in spite of the danger, in spite of the breaking of federal law, but they had to step out and do what was right. They <coughs> The people of the 1960s revolution, read, led by Martin Luther King and so many others, uh, brought about a revolution that changed all of our lives, affected all of us. In 1957, in an SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Council newsletter, shortly after the organization was formed, and six years before the Birmingham bus boycott, Martin Luther King Jr. described the ultimate aim of LCC. LCLC is to foster and create the beloved community. I like to think that this organization that we have founded, Restore Cleveland Hope, right here in Cleveland, and with the plan to establish an underground railroad teaching center in the Cozad Bates House, has something to do with that same vision of Martin Luther King, of the beloved community that he saw with three essential components. Reconciliation, all barriers, re religious, racial, cultural, and political will be broken. Freedom, all of us, all of us liberated from bondage, free for service and responsibility. Martin Luther King's mission never was one that meant helping black people. His mission really was freeing the whole country of the bondage of Jim Crow and the, and the legacy of slavery. And the third thing was hope. His faith that the beloved community, a society controlled by the law of love, would obtain. 
I think we, every once in a while, we get it right, and we get close to that idea of the beloved community. And then there are times when I think it takes a great deal of courage to even talk of peace. Sometimes peace and justice are, are more frightening to speak about than their opposite. Martin Luther King not only used the tactic of nonviolence, but he believed it was a way of life. He was influenced by Gandhi. Oh, by the way, have you seen the extraordinary statue of Gandhi that's in the cultural gardens? It is exquisite, and there is Gandhi, the statue, this image of this man striding toward the lake, toward freedom for all. My printer didn't print in my speech. I don't have it with me. <laughs> Which doesn't usually bother me, but it's like having it as a security blanket, even though I rarely read it. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, not a little bit, I wanted to talk more about the fact that the Cosette Bates House, that in 1853, Andrew Cosette built a home for his son, Justice, and it's that beautiful red brick building on Mayfield just before you go up the hill to into uh, Little Italy. It was a home that was owned by the University Hospital for many years. It stood empty for almost 20 years, and People, the Restoration Society, uh, Hunter Morrison and the Planning Commission had been working for 30 years to save it, to prevent it from being torn down. And once we, Virginia Rook, who was my classmate here at SAS 50 years ago, but May Douglas, a neighbor, Benny Iger, also a descendant of Horace Ford, and Nishani Frazier, who worked at the Western Reserve Historical Society, and Fran Stewart and I gathered around that dining room table that, that Eric referred to as we laid our plans to save the house and to establish the organization. The organization's mission, its dream, was something beyond the house, but we needed to save that house so that we could establish an underground railroad. I'm so happy that we're well on the way, and with the help of this wonderful team of consultants from Mandel School. They're helping us with the strategic planning and work. And it's fun as well as exciting to be working with them. I just spent an hour with a small group talking about race. That's what this walk was about. That's what the Underground Railroad was about. That's what the 1960s rev Civil Rights Revolution was about. This country's racism founded in the slavery that began this country has left a legacy that we're still struggling through. And I just spent the hour we had lunch before this talk, and I spent the time with some staff people from CASE, and it was so exciting to hear the conversation go back and forth, to hear the, their description and concerns and ideas that came out of their own experiences about the use of the word nigger. It 
it was, I found it wonderful because that's the kind of thing that we want to be able to put into the COSAD base house. We want it to be not only a teaching center, but a safe house so that the kind of exchange that we need to be at as a community can take place. People didn't hold back around that table, that small group, mostly black, but several white. And, and it seemed to spark what they are hoping can go on to other discussions. I think that's a part of this walk that has been so astounding to me. When I took off, I had no idea what it would grow into. I couldn't have imagined where I am today and what has happened along this walk. I had no idea that once I stopped walking in 2003, that the journey would continue in the way that it has. We, I, <coughs> the walking has stopped, but I, I'm still talking. <laughs> I'm still encouraging the conversation, and it's a conversation that we all need to be included in. <coughs> I think, I think the most amazing part of my journey has been the people that have come to it with a passion that equaled mine. All kind of people, old and young, rich and poor, uh, black and white, children, adults, young people, and and people that I've have been friends for a long time were involved in the preparation for this and in the planning. In the early planning, in the early planning, friends came and helped me not only lay out the route, but had several women friends close to my age who actually drove down to Ripley to, to map out the space so that I, so that they would know that I would be safe. It's also interesting to know that it was people closer to my age that seemed to react and be sure that I would be safe all along the journey in a way that some younger people thought I might be in danger. That well, the way Kevin, my next door neighbor, put it, he did, Mrs. Southgate, we don't want you just staying at any old place. Well, the fact is, I did stay at any old place. My housing for this journey, um, two months in, in the spring of 2003, a week in the fall of 2003, and then three weeks in the following spring. My housing throughout that time was with all, always with perfect strangers. The emphasis on perfect, because these people met me, greeted me with a warmth and grace and generosity that made it made me feel as if I was a long lost friend or relative. And there were all kinds of people, all kinds of housing. Some of them joined me on the walk itself. Sometimes, as most of the time when I was walking, I was walking, uh, seemed to be walking alone. I always had a driver, always had a driver, and the driver would pull six miles ahead and I would start walking. That took me two hours, and then I would reach the driver. The drivers were all volunteers using their own cars, and I would meet them, and then we'd have breakfast together. People sometimes ask if there was ever a time on the walk that I felt afraid or there was any, any incident that was difficult. And the fact is that it feels like once I began the walk and, and started my dining room as my planning stage, one of the first things I did was to put up a banner that said, may I be filled 
with loving kindness. May I be well, may I be peaceful and at ease. May I be joyful. Something about carrying that mantra with me seemed to bring that same joy from out of the countryside. I never had one single thing that was difficult along the path. There was one incident when I was in southern Ohio. I started in Ripley because that was right on the Ohio River and was an important underground railroad uh, town. And then went to Cincinnati because that's where my husband was born to uh, Xenia, Yellow Springs area because that my, my daughter went to Antioch, then to Columbus, Overland, and back to Cleveland. Once when we were in Southern Ohio, though my husband was born in Cincinnati and had terrible memories of the racism there, I was totally oblivious because by then I was on my walk and was having just a grand experience. But once when I was in Southern Ohio, the people that were my drivers, they were aware that I was in Klan country. I wasn't. What was so interesting, I thought that they were just being friendly and helpful because they seemed to be leapfrogging the leapfrogging, the, my driver usually pulled ahead and six miles, of course, is out of sight and I looked like I was walking alone. On this day, uh, the was McCuskey uh, and, her, and my other driver uh, would pull one after the other so that I would look up and wave to them and think, how sweet. <laughs> How nice. It wasn't until the e later when we met for breakfast that they explained that it was Klan country and each of them had a story of recent history and personal history when uh, they had been uh, warned to get out of a small southern Ohio town and once when uh, Rosa saw two men in full clan regalia just strolling down the street to, the, to their meeting, I suppose, in the same way that she was going to her Girl Scout meeting. That was that, and oh, was the only time that they were afraid and I wasn't. It sh turned out that when we went to breakfast and oh, it was just me and the gentleman that was my driver. We walked into this family diner, and when we walked in, the, the, there was a man, young man sitting here at a booth, and then four people sitting at a table uh, closer to the door. And as we walked in, someone at this, a man at this table said, it's getting crowded in here. Two blacks have walked in, everyone else is white. Uh, I said, good morning. <laughs> and this young man said, hello. I walked past him and sat, we, the two of us walked past him and sat down and the waitress greeted us with the usual, my name is, Kathy, and uh, waiting to serve me, and I said to her in the same uh, stage whisper that he had used, I said, that man said, it's getting crowded in here, and you know what that means, and she said, well, he comes in here all the time. If it's crowded, we'll throw him out. <laughs> do I feel blessed? I do. I feel blessed because on this walk, even an incident like that, where he was really trying to get something started because as the waitress was asking for our, our order, he came and knocked her 
uh, pushed her, and uh, she directed him back to his seat. Even though he kept at it, his friends, three friends, would not be engaged, and so the power <laughs> of, of the waitress and me and my friend and driver took over that space, that huge dining room, and didn't let it fall back to something that could have been ugly. I really feel feel blessed. It feels like miracles have happened ever since I asked, answered the ancestor's whisper. This has grown into something I couldn't imagine, could not imagine, and it has created this whole new organization. We will have our uh, Underground Railroad Teaching Center, and we have people coming to it in the same grassroots way as people responded to uh, Martin Luther King's uh, meeting during the 1960s. Martin Luther King left a legacy to all of us and to his wife, Coretta, because as she worked beside him and beyond his death, she has always, always worked for justice and, and social justice and peace. She was actually the founder of an early peace organization, and after, even after King's assassination, assassination, within four days of his assassination, she was in Memphis leading a huge dem demonstration and had her four children with her. How do people have that kind of courage? I'm not sure where it comes from. I'm not sure how, how to sustain it, but I know that I have been I, honored to have so, to be introduced to so many groups, so many organizations, large and small, who are all working in this grassroots kind of way for the same things that King, for the same things that the people, the free blacks, free whites, Native American Indians worked on the Underground ra Railroad. and the many organizations that are working here in Cleveland today. Coretta King, af even after um, her husband's death, expanded what, what the organization saw as their work. She was really strong in speaking out for gay and lesbian rights and though I'd never heard one of her talks, I, I can imagine what that must have been like when she stood up and spoke against homophobia in some of the southern black churches. Can't you just see the church ladies behind their fluttering fans <laughs> and not agreeing at all, and yet, that's what I mean about the courage it takes to talk about justice. It takes courage to take a talk about justice. It takes courage to talk about peace. It takes courage to talk about establishing that beloved community, a community where all barriers are broken down, religious, racial, cultural, political, all barriers, and that we come together. Um, Martin Luther King said that I am my brother's keeper because I am my brother's brother. He didn't live to see the community come into existence. And some may think that we're a long way off. I don't think so. I think it's just around the corner. 
I think if you pay attention to who you're sitting next to, if you pay attention to who you're having dinner with, who's across the table, if you pay attention to your own neighborhood, your own church, your own school, your own book club, your own political action group, all of those things, instead of some of the horrors that the media presents to us, you may be seeing the existence of the beloved community in small neighborhoods, in small groupings. And I think just below the surface, something is about to bubble through. Do I see skeptical faces in the audience? What do you think? A beloved community. No response. <laughs> I a, a small group of us have responded to uh, Jean Shinoda Boland's book. And he, even if you don't read the book, the title should intrigue you. The title is Urgent message from mother, gather the women and save the world. <laughs> Perhaps it will take that kind of leadership. Perhaps. I know that um, when I think of the Beloved community, and I know that the people that surround me are a part of that. Um, I think that it's not only probable, that it's possible. I was at, I was talking to my friend Deb McCann, maybe some of you know her. She runs the Cultural Exchange, and uh, Deb talks a lot. She's one of those people that my mother used to say, their mouth runs like water. <laughs> but she talks a lot, but what she's saying is usually so great that she don't, no one minds that she talks a lot. So I saw her just earlier this week and we were having our, our sort of long goodbye at the door. And she reminded me, she said to me, um, do you remember I met your mother once? I didn't remember. There's an Akan word, Sankofa. It means go back and fetch it. The Akan people of Southern Ghana proverb is, it is not taboo to go back and fetch it. To go back for the wisdom of learning from the past to build the future. So, I'd forgotten. When you forget, go back and fetch it. I'd forgotten that she had met my mother, and she proceeded to describe how my mother wore her hair in this little poof on the top of her head. She talked about my mother's elegant demeanor. And my mother was this amazing, strong, gentle, wonderful woman um, who died one day after her 90th birthday when I was 60. And at 60, felt that I had been suddenly horribly orphaned. She talked about my mother, and I thought about my mother. I can remember waking in the middle of the night and seeing her sitting at my, in my bedroom, looking out my bedroom window into the dark. And I wouldn't say a word, because one of the things my mother used to say was, I do some of my best work at night. I didn't want to disturb her. She looked safe, and she looked like she was in the room to protect me and keep me safe. I, I know that my mother would be proud 
of the fact that we're all working, all, everyone associated with Restore Cleveland Hope, our wonderful team of and of consulting team, and all those organizations that I have come in contact with, that we're all working to bring into the existence of the beloved community. I'm an old feminist, so often when I go back to fetch it, the strong black women sort of blend together. Harriet Tubman, Harriet Jacobs, Charlotte Henson, Fannie Lou Hamer, Coretta Scott King, and my mother, they all blend together. And they all remind me of this wonderful poem by an Ohio poet, Mary Evans. I am a black woman. The music of my song, some sweet arpeggio of tears, is written in a minor key, and I can be heard humming in the night, can be heard humming in the night. I saw my mate leap screaming to the sea, and with these hands cupped the life breath from my issue in the cane break. I lost Nat swing, Nat's swinging body in a rain of tears and heard my son scream all the way from Anzio for a peace he never knew. I learned the Nang and Porkshop Hill in anguish. Now my nostrils know the gas and these trigger tired fingers see the seek the softness of my warrior's beard. I am a black woman, tall as a cypress, strong beyond all definition still, defi defying place and time and circumstance, assailed, impervious, indestructible. Look on me and be renewed. whisper would lead to this incredible journey. And this certainly feels like circling right around, from starting in the circle and then founding the organization in the circle and coming home to SAS and Case Western University. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and that's a great segue because we want you to always remember Case Western Reserve and what you mean to us. And Dr. Eastwood mentioned that calendar. And so what we have, <laughs> we have, this is Joan's class picture. <laughs> and we've had it blown up, matted, and framed. Uh, it's exquisite. <laughs> and, and so here I am, and here, but here is Ginger Mook. So Ginger Mook is one of the one of the founders of Restore Cleveland Hope. We hadn't been in contact for all that 50 years, and she came back into my life. And here's Ginger sitting right there. We were in SAS together. This is what happened all the time along this journey. Things worked out things circled into each other. And it's not coincidences, it's miracles, mm -hmm. all kinds of miracles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
And we are we are gonna have this on display next door at the reception. So it's beautiful. Thank you so much. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a few folks. Let's give Joan another round of applause. Would the MLK committee please stand? All of you that had something to do with this program today, we want to say thank you. Stand up, don't be shy. <laughs> Dean. <laughs> no great program happens in a vacuum. Um, we want to especially thank Eric Dickens because as we were considering all of the speakers, both locally and nationally, that we have, could have had, once we heard the compelling story that Eric told, we said, we don't need to go anywhere else. We need to go in our own neighborhood to our own alumni and have a wonderful speaker speak. So thank you, Eric. <laughs> We've been talking a lot today about coming full circle. And I want to acknowledge a special group today that has joined us. Would the children from the Sunbeam School please stand? And I ask you to stand because you are our future. The things that you learn today, you have no idea where your journey is going to take you. We didn't all start off as big shots standing up here. <laughs> Many of us are Cleveland Public School graduates. We had the opportunity to come to programs like this. We heard things that were inspiring, and that led us full circle. And that's how we ended up here today. So we want to pay special homage to you today for being here and your teachers. You sit, sit down. Thank you. We are, would be um, most delighted if you would join us for a reception in Joan's honor and to have some refreshments with us. As you know, Joan has written a wonderful book, and the books are for sale right here in the hallway. And Joan has graciously agreed to um, have a book signing along with the refreshment period next door. It's going to be held right in the Delbert Hall. We'd also want to remind those of our colleagues, students, staff, and faculty here at CASE that we have a special essay contest going on, and there is still time to enter that contest, and the prizes are money, so that always comes in handy. As we leave today, I would just like to ask you a couple of questions. As Joan was speaking, some words popped out in my head. She mentioned courage. When you think of the word courage, what do you have the courage to do in the face of danger and fear? Today, what do you have the courage to do as you face fear and danger? Hope, what is it that you are hoping for your own future, the future of Cleveland and the future of the world? Freedom, what will you do personally, individually to influence the freedom of the beloved community that Joan, Dr. King, and his wife spoke of. And finally, we all hear the whispers in our ears, and sometimes they sound ludicrous. And you go, me? You talking to me? Whoever your higher being is, is talking to you. And will you keep ignoring the whispers? Or like Joan, will you respond to them? Thank you.